Hi everybody, um, there's so much to talk about this week and I almost didn't know where to start. I'm so excited. <laughs> I love Harry Potter and um, I didn't want to confuse you. So I've put together um, two different handouts that we're going to go over. There are a few things going on this week um, because now we're further into the book. Now things are really starting to happen and the story is really getting going. We're approaching the middle of the book and so you know there's going to be a lot of action. Um, this is where the true story unfolds and because of that we get some major themes that occur and in addition to that we also get a really um in, i mean we get some interesting things happening actually on the surface level in the actual story but as far as the development of plot as far as all the things going on that are incredibly rich with meaning that are going on beneath the surface I, we have to talk about it all. So I'm going to start off actually talking about what's going on beneath the surface. Um, so I'm giving you the first handout, and this is what yours looks like, the web of gender. So this is for you to follow along and take notes if you wish. And I've included um, a copy in two different forms, PDF, if you can print it at home, um, and also a Microsoft Word document so that you're able to just fill it in uh, on the computer that you're using. Okay, so let's begin. The web of gender. So what we see in the very beginning is that Harry assumes two different protagonist forms, both masculine and feminine. So in the beginning of the book, we see um, that Harry is kind of surrounded by male energy, male characters, except for Professor McGonagall, but every, every other magic form uh, is male. And so when we get into chapters um, 7 through 12, which is this, the, what we're reading this week, you can see that boys and men uh, and, you know, wizards tend to dominate the scenes. Um, they're the ones that are determining the action as wizards and as sorcerers. The girls or the women or, and the witches, um, it's not that they're unlikable. Um, but they are more, they're put in the position more as helpers, enablers, and instruments to help the wizards enact whatever it is that they're doing. So Harry really takes on a cyclical journey here. And I think that this is why Harry Potter is so gosh darn popular with girls and boys alike. Because he does take a cyclical journey um, that's very similar to Cinderella. If we just look at the basics of the way that that fairy tale works and the way that it moves. Um, so we see Harry taking two different journeys at once. He's taking, well, he's taking several different journeys at once actually, but he's taking a journey on the surface where he's leaving home and then he is finding a new home in a new magical world, right? So there's muggle world and non muggle world for Harry. That's one journey, right? There's like a physical journey. That's what we're used to seeing a male protagonist do. But what we also tend to see is that he's taking an inner journey as well because he is growing up. This is a coming of age tale. So we actually see him taking two different journeys simultaneously that combine both the typical masculine and feminine journey here. So we see him as a passive subject at home, much like Cinderella right? When she's a servant. Um, and then we see him being very active at Hogwarts in the magical world, which is very similar to Cinderella at the ball. Um, both lead to the blooming of a hero. Um, this is so reminiscent of a girl's tale because this is how we see female protagonists traditionally develop um, in a coming of age tale. So I think that that's why this enables female readers to identify even more with Harry as both a feminine and masculine hero, um, which is pretty atypical. But I think that Harry Potter is the perfect hero in this in this time. Um, and we get some very 
typical gender stereotypes here uh, with women in Harry Potter, which I always find to be pretty interesting because, of course, um, this is a female author, right? And this is just a little interesting known fact. I don't know if you know this or not, but J.K. Rowling obviously is a woman. But um, the reason why she made her publishing name J.K. Rowling is because it made her sound, it made her name sound more masculine because she thought that boys might be hesitant to pick up a book if it's a not about a boy right so hence harry potter but also if it sounds like she's a woman right so the the part of the the purpose of getting uh this middle grade novel out there is to encourage boys to read which as you know tend to be uh, more challenging readers so here are the typical gender stereotypes that we get with women. So the wicked old stepmother is Petunia Dursley. Okay, so remember, she's horrible to Harry. Um, she doesn't treat him even like a child, really. She almost just treats him like an unwanted stray dog or something. Um, Molly Weasley is like the doting mother, right? So as um, his relationship with Ron develops, we start to see um molly weasley ron's mom really starting to you know be fond of harry and she you know feels for harry she's empathetic uh with harry because she knows that he's lost his parents and so she shows him the love that um he's missing and then the the character who's there but not there the entire story and the entire series is lily potter and that's harry's mother and she's the one who's protective and loving and her love envelops Harry in an ever-present protection. That's why he's alive in the first place. Um, and then we get the typical nagging sister, chatterbox, uh, foil character as Hermione, right? Even though she's very bright and very useful, you know, she really, they could not do this journey without her for certain, um, but she does assume that very typical gender stereotype. So, I'm thinking you're gonna like this. Instead of Cinderella, I'm calling Harry Potter Cinderfella. See what I did there? Just for your own enjoyment and mine. You know, I love a good pun. Um, so Harry Potter as Cinderfella. So we see him as a male Cinderella character. He is the child that's hidden and abused. Um, he is afraid of failure and he is hunted by evil in this new world. See, this is interesting because his life is failure in Muggle world, right? When he's living with the Dursleys, all he is, all he's capable of, all he can ever do or be is failure um, in their eyes. And he knows it. And once he traverses to this new world, now he has to think about wow, who do I want to be? Maybe this is my real chance. Maybe I can be somebody, you know, maybe I can be successful. Maybe I can just be accepted. Maybe I can have real friends, you know? And so there's like that test of who he truly is. Um, you know, of course he can't make it in the Dursley's household because everything is set up to make him fail, right? Failure is inevitable with them. But in this new world, this new life, he has a chance at something better, a chance to be greater, than he is in the Dursley's eyesight. And so because of that, um, I do think that he's dealing with the fear of failure and he's hunted by evil, which is a challenge that he doesn't have in Muggle World. See, Muggle World is safe, but it's not likable. It's not exciting, it's boring, it's dull, it's dank. He lives under the stairs. He doesn't even have his own room. You know, he doesn't have any friends. He doesn't experience love. Um, he can't bond with other children his age, but in this new world is exciting and just everything that life could be, should be, and at the same time is dangerous because he is being hunted by evil. Um, Harry Potter is Cinderella. So Cinderella, she never really escapes her upbringing, right? Even though she's treated like a servant in the castle that she grew up in, right? In the kingdom that's really her kingdom by birthright. Um, she never escapes her upbringing. She is exactly who her parents raised her to be, even though she's being cast in the, the position as a servant. Um, Harry Potter is Cinderella in terms of 
being in this perpetual loop of slavery and liberty, right? So he has to go home every summer, right? From the, from Hogwarts, right? So he, he's like, he's in boarding school, right? This is very something that's more, much more common in Europe. Um, although we do have some here, but he goes to boarding school. So for the majority of the year, he's happy, he's elated, he has friends, he has love, right? And then he goes back home <laughs> and he goes back home to the Dursleys in Muggle World. And so because of that, he really is kind of in this perpetual loop of slavery and liberty. That's exactly what Cinderella undergoes when she's going to the ball and then she has to run home by midnight, right? Because the, the facade disappears. And then there's this personal struggle i think that harry's dealing with with inadequacy and power so he probably feels as inadequate as the dursleys think he is because he hasn't been taught about himself he hasn't been taught about his history his family he knows nothing of that so he can't really identify with that so he's struggling with this inadequacy and power and that's the same kind of struggle that cinderella deals with as well and that's why i think it connects to children because children feel like oh i'm i'm really this but nobody sees me as this you know and and my personal theory is that we we spend our whole lives you know trying to prove to the world and show the world who we really are so that they will too accept it and find out and the reason we love cinderella is because she's good she's overlooked but one day People are going to recognize her and see her for who she truly is. And the same thing happens with Harry. Um, Harry's journey is wrought with f feminine symbols. I mean, we get so much here that connotes the feminine witch from the very beginning. I mean, from the moment that he says yes and accepts the invitation to attend Hogwarts. So one of these things, I um, just have a list here for you the pewter cauldron right the, just think about the shopping list all the things that he had to buy um when he was with hagrid all the things he had to buy in the shop when he encountered um draco malfoy for the first time pewter cauldron long robes the pointed hat um once he get and we'll see this in chapters 7 through 12 but once he gets into hogwarts um he's taking all the stuff that nobody really wants to take because they want to take the the courses that are it's like hard magic you know fighting evil all the exciting things but they're forced to take things like potions and herbology uh classes you know this is like the soft nature of magic this isn't what um they need necessarily to fight evil right um so they're not getting that information right away so it's like the soft nature of magic it's the more feminine nature of magic potions and herbology you know um hedwig his owl is athena's symbol she's the goddess of wisdom um the greek goddess of wisdom and then um of course what the book is named for the philosopher's stone um which actually i think interestingly enough represents masculine and feminine okay so if we think about the sword and the stone and you think about that story that's feminine and masculine put together right the sword is the phys the masculine thing the, the stone is the feminine thing and um so the philosopher's stone represents personal gain everlasting life wealth um you know only in the only in the denial of what it has to offer um does Harry conquer evil in the end? Only because he's willing to not take those things. He's willing to not be selfish. He's willing to not seek those things for his own personal gain. Um, that's why he's able to conquer the evil in the first place. But I won't say too much more about it because if you haven't finished reading the book yet or you've never read it before, I will not spoil that for you. <laughs> um, the next thing is Harry's scar. So I'm seeing this as a feminine symbol for the following three reasons. Um, this is like his magical third eye that senses danger. So this operates as a reminder of the evil that it protects against, right? If we look at the second thing, if we look at the Hindu god Shiva with a third vertical eye centered on his forehead, um, blazing with the fire of 10 million suns that can consume any creature with flame, if we see that, 
as Harry's scar, then it becomes so much more meaningful there. And remember that it's like a gash, which is a feminine symbol. It's like a gash, like a lightning bolt, also representing Shiva, that burns with aggressive male power and is an opening of feminine nature as in a wound.